Okay, are we ready to go? Everybody? Okay, so I'm going to um, start uh, in, in uh, Mediares, as they said in this neck of the woods um, a couple of, mil couple of thousand years ago, um, where we're talking about universal Turing machines. Everybody remembers and has completely integrated into their genome itself the differences between a deterministic fine automata and Turing machines and so on. A heartfelt, cheery yes. Good, good. That's exactly what I wanted. So now we're going to be talking about um, uh, some more of what the very powerful things are that you can do with Turing machines um, and uh, some of the uh, rather um, amazing implications for um, all of uh, human mathematics. So remember last time I was talking about, is there any bizarre chance that this would work? I doubt it. Nope. No power. Um, so last time, uh, we were talking about uh, universal Turing machines. These are Turing machines which actually take uh, two inputs. You can think of these as just one long tape where um, there's a unique code that takes the um, uh, bit string on the tape and maps it to two inputs. Alternatively, you can think of it as a variant of a Turing machine which actually has two tapes. It doesn't actually, at the end of the day, matter for any of the results that I'll be presenting, um, for actually any of the results in computer science theory. But if you recall, what a um, universal me... Turing machine does is it um, uh, set, says what is the, takes its second input, interprets that as a... So the um, uh, audio Sorry? is a little bit, uh, is not very good. So I think it would get better if you take off the mask. Um, if, if you don't mind. I'd prefer to... Uh, it sounds good in here. Um, maybe I have to... Look at this okay, uh, I'll work on it. Okay, it's being worked on, I guess. Um, so anyway, recall that a, the universal Turing machine, the, uh, remember that the um, set of all Turing machines has the same cardinality as the integers, so we can actually represent every single Turing machine as a unique bit string. The universal Turing machine takes its second argument, that bit string, interprets it as a code for a Turing machine, and then it runs that Turing machine on the uh, first input to the uh, universal Turing machine to produce the um, output of the second argument um, if it ever halts. So the way to think about this is it's just an um, interpreter. Just like in uh, computer science, in your laptop, you could actually code up something that does this. That it takes a specification, for example, in some other language of a program, along with an input to that program, and then it actually runs it. OK? And we call the Holton theorem says that there is no Turing machine that is total, meaning that it actually comes to a answer for every single input that you can use to compute whether this universal Turing machine will halt for every possible input. So in other words, there's no Turing machine such that you can give it U and V, and it will tell you, does V halt on input U? This is an uncomputable function beyond the capability of human minds. Okay, we cannot do this. It's a well-defined function, but it's beyond our ken. And, okay, so now this is not working again. There we go. Um, the uh, proof, it's um, relatively straightforward. It goes by, well, there are several variations of it. Cantor diagonalization again. It's a central theme in many, many branches of mathematics. Here is a, a one way to use Cantor diagonalization to prove the halting theorem. To find this function, um, h of ij, it equals 1 if Turing machine i holds um, if the, um, one input j, and it equals negative 1 otherwise. So this is the um, Turing machine that we would want to be able to exist, um, would be one that actually um, uh, computes um, h of ij. 
So um, uh, by hypothesis, let's hypothesize that there is um, uh, such a function that's defined for all of its inputs. That means that the negative of h, which flips things around, is also defined for all of its inputs. So here you list all the Turing machines. Remember, they have the same cardinality as the integers. Here we list what the um, output of what the value of h is for um, uh, that Turing machine and this initial value into the Turing machine. Here we look at the negative function on the diagonal only. And there's counter diagonalization again, that you can prove that there is no Turing machine along this, in this list that can actually input this. That, that can, sorry, that can produce that as its outputs when it's, produced, when it's given this Turing machine with that particular input. Okay, um, here is a slight variant, in some sense even more compelling than of the halting theorem, which says that there is no Turing machine that can tell you whether some other particular Turing machine will halt on a blank input. So we're now not even worrying about the inputs. Just as, as using the uh, program itself, and there is no Turing machine that can say whether your program will actually halt on uh, no, uh, no input for an arbitrary um, uh, program. Can anybody tell me, I guarantee that everybody in this room has encountered many, many times programs that actually do not halt, and they just have to simply kill them. So can somebody tell me an example of such a thing that you have actually run into to make this a bit more concrete? <coughs> If you've ever run a piece of code that enters an infinite loop that you did not want, Go bang, down. you just actually um, uh, encountered a variant of the, uh, a certain aspect of the halting problem in that you did not know ahead of time that it was going to actually, for that input, enter that infinite loop and never produce an output ever. So that code that you wrote, it's a partial function. It was not defined for that particular input because it never ended. Okay, and this is saying that the same kind of a thing can happen even if your code, um, your program isn't actually having any input at all, just a blank string. Um, so why would this be interesting? Here is a very fascinating concept, um, goes back to the uh, 50s, I think, 50s or 60s. It's called a busy beaver function. So um, uh, let's uh, write some terminology um, note that for any integer, there's only a finite number of Turing machines that have that integer number of internal states. There's only a finite number of Turing machines that have, for example, four states. Because the rest of the um, aspects of the Turing machine are defined by its particular output uh, um, update function, and which of those states is the initial one, which is the final one. There's only a finite number of those things. So in general, the, um, uh, we can uh, define this right here. So this is the set of all Turing machines that have n states, and there's going to be some number of them. It's not a very big number. For each one of those, um, the one, for each such n, every one of these Turing machines is either going to halt on the input 0 or all, um, all blanks after um, s of um, TNI steps or never halt. Uh, technical difficulties, I guess, going on. Everything okay? I'm sorry. I'm going to have to interrupt for two minutes. Um, we're having a problem with the audio. Um, could you turn this in? Mm -hmm. Sorry about this. Mm -hmm. Um, people in Zoom, can you hear me better with this microphone? Yes. Okay. Uh, so if you don't mind using this while we solve the problem, and I'll take this away. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Fortunately, fortunately I have two arms. One to hold my mic, my, um, mic one to gesticulate. But I actually need a third one, I suppose, to control this. Um, but in any case, so for example, we're all good to go. I'm hearing somebody. 
Then again, there are Turing machines that just don't do anything close to what you actually designed them for. <laughs> Never mind if they're faulty. <laughs> and I think that those ones have been leaking in from the rest of the matrix, taking over this course. Or is the hyper task an uncomputable computer? <laughs> yeah, it's figuring out. It's an infinite loop. Are we, everything over, we're all good to go? Okay, should I move that over here? Okay. Um, modern technology. Let's see if we could actually manage what was current in the 1930s. Um, okay, um, uh, everybody then uh, back into uh, this reality from the matrix. So anyway, let's say um, N is four. So we are on um, this right here is the uh, list of um, all Turing machines which have four states. Um, for each one of those, I'm going to write S of T and I for the number of steps it would take to halt. There is some function um, S that for any Turing machine says if I give it a blank, um, what are the number of steps before it halts? Or instead, this can um, uh, simply be undefined if it never halts. Okay? Define the busy beaver function to take this number of states and then simply say what is the maximal value, what is the maximum number of steps that any Turing machine with that number of states takes to halt, assuming that they ever halt. So you don't include in that max any Turing machine that never halts. So for example, for n equals 4, this is going to be the uh, maximum number of steps any Turing machine with four states would take to um, halt if given an input string that was all blanks. OK? Everybody understand what the uh, busy, it's kind of an odd thing, but it's called the busy beaver function, because um, you have a busy beaver, I guess. But anyway, here's the theorem. BB of n, the busy beaver function, it actually grows with n, its argument, faster than anything you can ever write down. You could play all kinds of games of n to the n to the n, to the exponential of the n, write down whatever function you want that's increasing. BB of n increases faster. So we're talking about some of the most simple mathematical concepts that are beyond human capability. Just does a function increase? This has got nothing to do with p equals np or Poincaré conjectures or anything like that. This is provably a harder problem than we can ever solve to just make something that increases that. And the proof is actually quite simple given this puppy up here. Computer scientists are sneaky beasts the way that they leverage their theorems. Um, let's see, it's kind of blocked on my screen. But let's say, um, uh, hypothesize that we actually could compute the busy beaver function. Then what we could do is we could write a piece of code that runs all the Turing machines with, say, four states for BB of n plus one steps. We know by the definition of BB and n that any Turing machine that has not halted by then will never, ever halt. But by the halting theorem, we know that it's impossible to write a program that will tell you whether an arbitrary Turing machine halts. Bing, bang, boom. This number grows faster than anything you can write down. Oh, you limited little creatures, you. OK? Nobody should believe this, by the way. But you go back, and the math is not going to give you any wiggle room. But it doesn't make sense. OK, now on to one of the uh, central concepts of, oh, I don't know, all of reality. Sorry, David. What? Can you compute it for n equal one, two, three, four? Yes, four? and it has been computed for very small numbers. It uh -huh. depends on your precise choice of the universal Turing machine that you're using to define this. This right here is um, implicitly there's a universal Turing machine, but it can be computed for small numbers. Um, if the universal Turing machine, for example, back in the uh, 50s, this was computed where your universal Turing machine was the language Lisp. 
-hmm. and it was known for like four, five, six, seven. It's also known what are some of the numbers that are too big for us to be, that they're actually, they are uncomputable. So uh -huh. it is known things like what the busy beaver function is for a particular programming language for n equals four, five, six or so. It is also known for particular languages that once you get up to things like busy beaver function of 50, that that number is actually uncomputable. Okay, so you can actually do some things concretely. Okay, it, so because just because you say that, for example, is an answer is a part of your answer, that uh, for example, it depends on the specific like the universal Turing machine that you're using. So, is there a way to cheat on this by like collectively using Turing machines and so on and so forth, or is just like there's an infinite number of universal Turing machines. Yeah. So we can't do it collectively, but if you remember, um, I'll, I don't want to actually risk changing this. But if we go so back yeah. um, uh, several slides, there's what's called the invariance theorem, which is crucial, which in computer scientists take it to mean that we don't need to worry about the actual um, Turing machine that we're using. Um, actually, am I going to get to it in a second? Yes. Um, give me a slide or two, and I will address that. OK. So Komogorov complexity. Everybody here has heard about um, things like how to measure the complexity of the universe. And people, especially from uh, the uh, high Sangre de Cristo uh, foothills near Santa Fe, New Mexico, are all really besotted with the notion of how do you measure complexity. One of the early notions um, due to this, um, well, I often, view, I often characterize people like Komogorov or Shannon or Turing as being aliens or people from the far future because they just did way too much with too much brilliance. There's no way that mere human beings could have done this. But in any case, one of these um, semi-aliens, um, uh, Komogorov, um, he came up with a definition of complexity that actually what was motivating him, even though he came up with all probability theory, he said, yeah, that's good, but nah. I want to actually be able to come up with things like measures of complexity that don't depend on probabilities. So he did a lot of work on trying to understand how you could define something random without worrying about probabilities. And also, um, uh, in this definition here, what the, um, how you can measure complexity without using probabilities. And this is also wound up with, um, like, Ray Solomonoff did this, um, used the same kind of a notion, trying to produce a, um, a a foundational derivation of um, uh, basically Occam's razor in machine learning. Um, I would expect many people have actually done that. I know I redid that when I was a grad student. It's not very hard to come up with this kind of an idea. And what it is is that you say the complexity of any given string is the length of the shortest program that actually computes that string. Program meaning Turing machine. So, for example, if I give you a string that's 10 to the fifth zeros, it has very, very small Komogorov complexity. Basically, here's a bit of C code that gives it to you. Pi, say the first 10 to the fifth five digits, it also has small um, Komogorov complexity. But this thing here, where um, these digits are, for example, made by quantum mechanical, um, like a Geiger counter or something, it has very large Komogorov complexity. Because the shortest um, program that produces it has length about 10 to the 5. That program is print. And then it gives you the number. OK? So um, the formal definition, so this is a way of measuring how complex a string is, basically how long a program you need to actually create it. So we uh, can formalize that by saying for a fixed universal Turing machine, let's define L of P as the length of a string P. The Komogorov complexity, just formalizing this, is the minimal value of any program, its length, such that the, this particular universal um, Turing machine, when fed with that program, will produce the output that you want. That's Komogorov complexity, OK? And now, going after one aspect of uh, Gilje's um, uh, question, um, here, are some, here are some characteristics of Komogorov complexity. First of all, it's obviously defined for all of its inputs. 
But as you'll see in a little bit, no surprise, we cannot actually compute it for all but a finite number of inputs, even though it's got an infinite number of possible inputs. So not only is it uncomputable in general, but in fact, there's only a finite number of inputs that we can compute it for at all. Also, there are very few strings with small Kolmogorov complexity. The way that you can see that is that for any particular um, a constant k, the number of strings with Kolmogorov complexity less than k has to be less than 2 to the k, because the 2 to the k is the, uh, max, is the maximum number of strings um, uh, with that length. So those are the maximum number of input programs that you could feed into your Turing machine to produce an output. And even if you were lucky and all of them actually produced um, uh, the string that you want, there still would be no more than 2 to the k of them. Here then is the uh, question that uh, Guljay was, an aspect of the question that Guljay was going after. Let me consider any two Turing, um, universal Turing machines, u and u prime. Then there is some constant that depends just on u and u prime and is independent of the actual um, output string whose Kolmogorov complexity we are considering, such that it bounds the difference of the um, Kolmogorov complexities. Since there's an infinite number of these um, output strings S, this is taken to mean that um, we can es essentially treat all universal Turing machines as identical as far as Kolmogorov complexity is concerned. The um, proof sketch is very, very simple. This function f, that is the length of a compiler that basically translates strings for u to strings for u prime. It's, for example, if, well, if u is c and u prime is Python, then this f is going to, um, intuitively, it's just going to be a compiler that cross compiles C code into Python code. OK? All right. Um, as I said, Komogoro complexity is compu uncomputable. Here is some intuition for that. Um, this is called the Berry paradox. It's a very famous paradox from the turn of the 20th century. It arose in the foundations of mathematics. Um, people like Russell and David Hilbert and so on and so forth. Here is the question. What is the smallest number that requires more than 70 letters to define? There are 70 letters in that question. Obviously, you cannot produce an answer to that question because you would have just defined it by that question. Let's say the answer were 72. Well. Um, uh, you've just actually defined that number 72, but by hypothesis, it takes more than um, 70 letters to define it, even though you just did that with a 70-letter question. Okay, so the basic idea is you translate that into um, an output string, say what is the number of letters required to define that number, and then you, um, you can basically show that the instantiation of this in terms of an output string cannot be computed. Here, um, yeah, so go past that. Here is a version of it that in some ways is far more compelling, far more daunting. This is sometimes called um, Chaitin's incompleteness theorem. And let Sorry? Oh, the Berry paradox? Yeah. Um, remember the invariance theorem. So. For all strings, the difference of the Komogoro complexity for all languages is going to be um, uh, less than some particular function of those two languages. So if this is actually undefined for one, it's also going to be undefined for the other. OK? Chaitin is in the completeness theorem. Let's walk through it um, a little bit carefully. There is some constant k. And um, uh, we, you can actually, using um, Lisp and so on, you can come up with bounds on it. And this constant, depending on your language, is on the order of several hundred. But there is some constant k such that there is no Turing machine that always outputs just a single bit, yes or no, and such that with the, um, in, and takes as an input a string s and some k prime greater than k. It outputs, it halts with the output yes for some input, and it will never halt unless its answer is whether the Kolmogorov complexity is greater than k prime. 
In other words, this is a very careful mathematical way of saying there is some constant k such that you can never, ever prove that the Kolmogorov complexity of a string is greater than k. Think about it. There's only a finite, a small number of strings that are output strings whose com who are complexity is less than k. There's an infinite number that's greater than k. We know that. But because we cannot um, enumerate all the ones whose Kolmogorov complexity is less than k, we can't actually pick out any one of those infinite ones and say, yeah, this is in that set. Is Kolmogorov complexity is greater than k. In terms of physics, that means, for example, you can never prove that the Kolmogorov complexity of the precise position and phase space of all the gas molecules in this room is greater than, say, about 1,000 or so. It could be that there is a program whose size is less than 1,000 or so. That's how much it could be compressed. For any fixed Turing machine, that program would actually give the position of all 10 to the 24 or so gas molecules in this room in phase space. You basically, you come to the edge of mathematics, and then you fall off. And there's an infinite C down there, and you can't figure out where you can go. Infinite set of mathematical questions with well-defined answers that humans cannot solve. OK, let's see. Let me skip past some of this stuff. Um, skip past that. OK. The definition of Kolmogorov complexity that I've just been giving to you, it's got some uh, aspects of it, some characteristics that um, one might object to as being not particularly aesthetic at a minimum. One of them is that it's not what's called subadditive. The Kolmogorov complexity for any two particular, if you give two arguments, we would like it, if this is going to be a measure of complexity, we would want it to be the case that the complexity of two particular um, uh, outputs to a program taken together is less than the sum of the complexities of each of the two outputs. For example, if my two outputs, one of them is pi, one of them is square root of two, I want to say what is the shortest program that will actually compute pi and square root of two. I would like to think that um, that's going to be less than the length of the shortest program that will compute pi plus the length of the shortest program that would compute square root of two. But it's actually not true with this definition of Kolmogorov complexity I just gave you. A, a very related problem is it's um, what's not called, uh, it's not monotonic over prefixes. And here is one where we're starting to get into really deep waters. To find this function g of x, what this is is the sum over all programs that you're inputting into a program which halt of 2 to the minus length of that program. There are many reasons, especially in the foundations of machine learning, that you would want this to be um, a, a semi-probability distribution. And just to remind people, a semi-probability distribution is just a normal um, probability distribution, but where the sum of all of its values can be less than 1, rather than having to equal 1. But there are many, many reasons why we would actually want this beast right here to be a semi-probability distribution. Unfortunately, when we're, using these, when we're using an arbitrary Turing machine, this actually equals infinity in general. So these are some aspects of what I've been presenting to you the past couple of days. Cool as it is, profound as it is, as much as it should be the case that if you've got any kind of an emotional fiber in your being, you should not be able to sleep for the next seven nights because you're staying up late at night worrying, what does this mean for my perception of reality? Despite all that, there's actually some problems here. Well, we now know how to fix them. I don't know whether this has to do with perception of reality or computability of reality. They are the same thing. Huh? Same thing. Same thing. There's, um, I, I can reduce this to a, a simple joke. Anything that's profound, truly profound, you know it's profound if it actually ultimately can be viewed as a joke that the universe is playing on us. 
is a simple joke from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that's got to do with the, the famous question about 42. Um, and what it says is that blah, 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 blah. And then at that point, the universe disappears in a poof of logic. The universe disappears in a poof of logic. This is the kind of inspiration behind that Doug Adams um, a statement. So um, being a little bit less glib, I don't want to get into this now, but there is some very good work uh, in philosophy. It's called ontic structural realism. Max Tegmark has um, a couple of, has a series of papers in which he reduced it to um, statements, mathematical statements, and first-order logic representation theory concerning the foundations of physics. And I, with um, a collaborator, were extending it to uh, models in which mathematics itself is actually a stochastic process, and basically. And I would argue this long and hard. Every time I have argued it long and hard, frankly, I've won that there is no way that you can justify thinking there is anything more to reality than math. It's all there. That is the lesson of quantum mechanics, nothing about wave particle duality. This is all math, no more real or unreal than some other body of math, because by definition, any experimental test that we can do in this body of math is given by this body of math. You, there's no concrete reality that we are describing. This gets into the foundations of philosophy and so on. But basically, what I'm doing is I'm pushing back very hard right now. I'm uh, elaborating what Gulja just said, that computability, reality, you sleeping late at night, they are all one and the same thing. So anyway, um, topics for discussion later on. So I'm um, getting back to reality here, um, or at least to uh, the weird dude up on the lecture giving some slides. Um, uh, the way we can, there's a way that we can actually solve these problems. And we'll, to do that, we're going to restrict attention to what are called prefix-free Turing machines. These are a subset of all Turing machines that the, um, uh, if you pick any one of the, any particular prefix Turing machine has the property that the set of all inputs that it halts on is a prefix-free set. And remember the definition of prefix-free. Um, Gulje um, uh, went over it very briefly, I think. Um, it's, it's foundational to Shannon coding theory. For example, all of Shannon information theory is um, assuming that your actual code words, your code book is actually a set of prefix-free code words. Yep. Okay, can you go back to one, one slide? One command, one question. First command. Do you hear? Yes, okay. So, yes, for example, if you take that h of x, like lower, like this, like uh, less, less than or equal to one, it's crafts inequ inequality, basically. The we'll first thing there. that we showed in the lecture. Question. Next slide. Um, well, I mean, we kept talking about how universal Turing machines are, and to solve a problem of universal measure of complexity, of complexity, we are restricting our attention. Yep, to so just to solve these, it actually. So there's not a universal solution to this problem. We're just like. Oh, this is um, correct. This is uh, universal. Nobody has proven that the only way of solving these particular problems is by restricting attention to prefix-free Turing machines. People have found that is a solution to those mathematical problems. So they're, um, uh, everything that is being done is an elaboration on that particular way of getting around these problems. So just as a follow-up question, so I mean, I'm not asking this as a student, but just as an observer, OK? Mm -hmm. So if we ha ha want to come up with this solution, and if it's not working universally, then maybe Kolmogorov complexity measure is not that universal. But this is a variant of Kolmogorov complexity that is. OK. I mean, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by universal, but. Like, I mean, you cannot solve this problem without restricting your attention to this tr third one, right? You'll see. OK. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thanks a lot. OK, so um, here is why this is a solution to the problem. Recall that there exists, so here's a theorem. There actually exists universal prefix-free Turing machines. So even if you restrict yourself to ones that um, only halt on prefix-free sets, there are those that are universal. So they can actually compute anything. So what that means is that if we choose any prefix-free Turing machine U and any other one, 
which is not necessarily prefix free, then for all strings, the difference in the Kolmogorov complexity um, of those two Turing machines is less than this constant. So as far as calculating the lengths of the shortest string that gives you under that Turing the universal Turing machine a desired output is concerned, as far as that problem, measuring complexity, we're fine restricting attention to prefix-free universal Turing machines because we get the correct answer to within a constant, and that constant is something that we've got to eat no matter what when we're using Turing machines. Okay? So, um, uh, let's see. Once you, so this uh, variant of Komogoro complexity where you're restricting attention, it's, some, it's often written in the literature like Lee Vitani with the, the K of X rather than a C of X. It is subadditive, as Gilder was emphasizing, by crash inequality, we now know that um, because we're restricting ourselves to the prefix-free set, the set of um, programs that this will halt for any particular x, that's prefix-free. Therefore, by crash inequality, this actually is a semi-probability distribution. Okay? Um, let's see. Let me skip through all this cool stuff. Okay. Now, some more um, uh, profound things. So I just gave you instructions. If you want to pass this course, you're not allowed to sleep for the next night, be, for the next seven nights, because if you do sleep, it means you don't really fully internalize what I'm saying. I'm now going to also add another requirement that you actually have two weeks in which you're not allowed to sleep because you're wrestling with what this means for what you thought reality was. Something that uh, Chaitin came up with, um, sometimes it's called the Chaitin's Omega, it's the halting probability. It's defined for prefix-free universal Turing machines. The halting probability is uh, simply given by this sum. Intuitively speaking, it is a probability that if you send in a randomly generated, by flipping a coin, uni um, uniform probability, you randomly generate an input string, feed it into a prefix-free universal Turing machine, th and then um, if you're restricting yourself to um, uh, such inputs that are in the prefix free set. Right, to, yeah. What is the prefix free? Uh, free Turing machine? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that this was um, given in the earlier lectures. Um, so, for example, um, it it's actually prefix free is a property of a set of strings. So, to give a very simple example, um, Actually, that won't work. There it is. That's a prefix-free set. Very, very simple, dumb one. So yeah, so in general, you've got it's a set of strings, S of I, such that there's no R and T that are both in the set where the concatenation is in the set. It's, um, it's related to what are called instantaneous codes. Um, this is, as I say, the foundations of Shannon's coding theorem and so on. The basic idea is that if I'm actually trying to decode a set of, stri of, stri of bits coming in, I can know when I've come to the end of a set of bits that I should now say, oh, okay, that set of seven bits I just saw, that's actually a code word. Let me go look it up. And then the next bits that I'm seeing is the next code word. So it's an alternative to the uh, dumb way of uh, using a, um, of uh, sending a set of multiple words down a channel, which would be at the beginning of each word, you specify the length of that coming word, the number of bits instead here, you're um, actually just using a code such that you can avoid that step entirely because you know when you're done. Okay, is that, is that clear to people? Okay, cool. So, the halting probability. We've got a prefix-free Turing, universal Turing machine, so it only halts um, uh, when the, um, uh, the input is a part of this prefix-free set. Because of crafts inequality, we know that this probability is well-defined. To actually, you can run this on your laptop. 
So start, and this has actually been calculated, the first several digits of omega. And again, it depends upon your precise choice of a computer language. But uh, what this is, is saying you just generate random bit strings. By random, I just mean I'm flipping a coin, uniform probability to get each zero and one. I know it's uniform because there's a two to the minus here. And I just start feeding them into my universal Turing machine. And any one of them that actually halts, I'm just going to add up this value here, which is um, uh, 2 to the negative the length of that particular input that caused the universal Turing machine to halt. So you can write a piece of code that do th does this. As I say, Kraft's inequality assures that this is all well defined. Um, the successive bits of omega, they, this is a single real number. And in that real number omega, this is like God's number, in that number, is included the answer to every mathematical question any human being will ever be able to ask. It's in there. And the way it's in there is very, very simple. You just des design a prefix-free Turing machine, universal Turing machine, such that for um, what it does is it takes any input, interprets it as a mathematical question, and just starts running through all possible proofs where it's going to be saying, is this question, is the answer to it yes, or is it not? And if it halts on that particular question, the answer is yes. And so you know that that's actually, so that's actually, you can show that that's going to be one of the bits in this expansion. Loosely speaking, each one of these bits codes for a different mathematical question. And whether the Turing machine halts on that question or not, which is giving you the value of that bit, that's telling you what the answer to that question was. P equals MP is in there. Everything is in there. Sorry, but, um, so, um, so there will be many, um, pro I mean, many questions uh, whose length of the program is equal. So is, is sorry? Um, no, no, any, no, any question no, that... I need to think about it. <laughs> Good. You're not going to sleep. So uh, Matteo passes the course. Um, so basically, any question that is well posed in the sense that you can write a computer program that can start working through all proofs in second order logic to try to prove, that, um, uh, to try to prove a particular answer to that question such that if that program ever stops and bing, then you've got a proof. Whereas if it never stops, then it's actually not provable. So that's the precise sense. It's got to do with saying that if the program that's checking through all proofs of your proposition never halts, then that by definition means it's not provable, your proposition. So, so my question is, uh, looks like, uh, um, so if you, if you consider the, the coefficient of uh, 2 to the minus n, uh, then uh, this is the number of uh, questions uh, for which uh, uh, you have a proof of length n, right? Um, uh, yes, you can work through, basically, as I say, um, I don't want to go through the details of it. Um, you, there's actually a nice Scientific American article, I think, about this from many decades ago. Um, basically, the successive bits, so let me be more careful when I say all uh, mathematical questions we can ask answers. What this actually tells you is every mathematical proposition where you can actually write a program and tell that program to halt if and only if it comes up with a proof, and you can choose it to be second order logic or any logic you want, that the actual um, uh, of what the proposition is, and otherwise not ever halt, that is in here. So for example, um, uh, the continuum hypothesis, that there's actually a cardinality that is greater than the integers but less than the real numbers, it's pr this would never actually halt because you cannot prove the continuum hypothesis. We now know that you can construct a consistent mathematics in which you can either assume the continuum hypothesis is true or you can assume it's not true. Similarly, the parallel line postulate of Euclid. We now know, of course, that you can, um, uh, it can't be proven, 
either that there are um, either the parallel line postulate or the negative. So you were to put this into um, the halting probability, it would never come out and say, I found a proof of it. Oh, it's very, very much Girdle and, and beyond. Yep. I have one question, two questions. One of them is easy. The other one is dumb. Okay, I'm so going to be quick, super quick. So yeah. they, we can actually find a solution because successive bits that construct the code word is uniquely decodable because we have perfect three code words, right? Just um, essentially, so essentially. So like we can uniquely identify the solution. Okay, then the second question is that let's say that I want to encode a question and so I'm coming, so you say that, because you say that math is like the underlying, like foundational, you know, like of physical reality. So as a physicist, let's say that you want to encode some question and find the answer. What is like, the, I mean, I understand it, like it's all great, like speaking mathematically on paper, but what if you want to encode something and just in find the answer? In other, word, in other words, if, if we are um, a couple hundred years from now, one of our starships lands on a planet and there's some we find the ruins of some advanced civilization. Might we, when we open up their vault, find a device that's calculating the successive bits of the halting probability? What would that device be like? Thank you. That's the <laughs> smart version of the dumb question that I asked. Um, uh, well, um, if you uh, remember this science fiction movie on this topic that actually hasn't been made yet, but that's irrelevant because we're way past simple notions of uh, time in this course. Um, uh, basically, nobody knows what it would be doing. Unless, I, you could right now do this on your laptop. <laughs> Matteo could start doing this because there's a language called um, Prolog, which actually generates all proofs to start running Prolog programs for every single mathematical proposition you can think of. So in practice, no one knows how to encode, for example, this question, problem of P equals MP, so no one actually tried to. Oh, no, no, it's very easy to do it. But it's just that when you start running that program, so far it's never halted. Oh. Doesn't mean it will. It doesn't mean that it won't at some point halt. But so far it's not. Can they? Okay, yeah, that's the great. Set of all, that's the fantastic. set of all mathematicians, they are a Turing machine, and they are running that program. And so far they've not halted. I mean, if you that way, there's a bit in here that's saying, "How will the Ukraine war end up?" <laughs> anyway, okay, so now to, um, so, oh boy, um, time is going to be tough. Um, um, okay, another nice, amazing thing about um, prefix-free universal Turing machines is they allow you, or more precisely, somebody much smarter than you called um, Levin, he was a Russian mathematician, to prove um, what's called Levin's coding theorem. And... I won't go through it, but basically what Levin's coding theorem allows us to do is to prove that with um, pre using prefix-free Turing machines, Kolmogorov complexity behaves just like Shan entropy does. By the way, I didn't mean to disparage people when I said much smarter than you. He's much smarter than me. He's much smarter than everybody. One of these ra Russian mathematicians is just brilliant. Um, but anyway, so we can uh, use um, uh, uh, com prefix free Kolmogorov complexity. We can define algorithmic mutual information. It obeys the uh, proper properties. And we can combine um, uh, for Kolmogorov complexity, a conditional, which is just like Shannon conditional entropy. And we end up with this really bizarre result right here that it's saying that, um, uh, let's see, this is a typo. Ignore that. IP right there. That should not be there. Sorry. But this is basically saying that um, the average um, algorithmic mutual information between any two bit strings averaged over bit strings is going to actually be equal to the mutual information between those bit strings according to that probability distribution to within a constant. Sort of. This is um, basically saying that Komogoro complexity does reduce to Shannon entropy in the limit. And so now let me see if I... Okay, I'll try to then quickly wrap it up to um, connect this up with thermodynamics very, very quickly. So um, let's see, let me go through this quickly. 
So the uh, Komogoro complexity of a bit um, string. Sorry, David. Uh, sorry to slow you down, but if you go back uh, just to understand this statement. Uh, yeah, I was so going to say this is a typo. That should not be there. Yeah, on the left hand side, uh, you have uh, uh, mutual information defined in probability. I mean, uh, yep, normal o one. over bit strings. Yep, mutual and information K over bit strings. And K of T is uh, a, a complexity of the. It's the Komogoro complexity of the actual probability distribution itself. Okay. Yep. Yep. And okay, and then is that is uh, bounded by, by the uh, algorithmic. Uh, I mean, the average of this. Uh, yep. Of uh, mutual information. Yep. So this okay. scum should look uh, very similar to you to things like the typical set, in uh, the asymptotic equal partition property. This is a similar kind of a thing where you've got a, a, a minus a constant on the left hand side and a plus a constant on the right hand side and mm -hmm. an average in the middle. Okay. Okay. All right, and so to finish up this first half of things, um, and boy, I could have used that coffee right now. Um, so Komogoro complexity, it's saying that the um, complexity of a string is the uh, minimal length of any string that would actually compute the one whose complexity you're interested in. Okay, I've just proven to you that this concept has proven to you, um, so to speak, that this concept has all these profound aspects that are going to be keeping you up at night, but essentially that's ultimately aesthetics. There's also um, uh, paintings in the Prado Museum that are really profound and will keep you up at night, but this is actually um, uh, far away from really concrete concerns. It's, it's not really I, you know, I'm pontificating about how physics is ultimately reducible to Turing machines and all mathematical questions and so on. But concretely, if we're interested in things like the computation in human brains and the energetic constraints, we want to relate these kinds of concepts. We want to transform these concepts so that they involve thermodynamics. Okay, so what is an obvious, trivial, everybody in this room should be able to do this um, in, a, <laughs> in the final exam, don't worry, but... Um, it could have been a question in the final exam. Um, variant of Komogoro complexity that's more thermodynamic. Well, rather than saying what is the minimal input to a given universal Turing machine that will cause that universal Turing machine to compute a string I want, what is the minimal heat flow, the minimal entropy flow, the minimal thermodynamic work that would be required over any physical instantiation of a Turing machine to get it to actually compute the desired output and halt. So this is what an engineer is going to be concerned with. This is what somebody designing this laptop will be concerned with. And the answer you can prove, and it's a squirrely way of deriving this, and I certainly don't have time to get into it now, is that you can view it as a correction to Komogoro complexity. It's the Komogoro complexity plus, um, let's see, notation got flipped around. This is basically um, uh, two to the minus length of V um, uh, normalized. If, uh, remember, we were talking about um, this, right? Uh, no, go back one. Yeah, this quantity here. The uh, G of, what I'm writing now in these slides is G of V is basically that for the string V. And this is actually Chaitin's constant. It's playing the role of a normalization constant, a partition function. Chaitin's constant, the halting probability, it's a partition function, or its logarithm is. So this is a modification of Komogoro complexity that tells you how, what is the minimal amount of work to produce this string rather than what is the minimal length input that will produce that string. So some intuition behind this, or some of its properties. Here, very, very abstractly um, shown, um, boy, this is kind of screwed up. That time right there, that should be a label on the x-axis. But here is time of a Turing machine, universal Turing machine, iteration number. Here is the state of the universal Turing machine um, arranged um, for increasing Komogoro complexity. And so these are actually programs that will all, at the end of the day, um, input programs that will, at the end of the day, produce the same output string. Recall that, um, going, going back to Landauer, we have known that thermodynamic work is required whenever we actually combine 
two states and lose information about the um, predecessor. When you run a Turing machine, that's happening all the time. When I run this laptop, if you're given a coding assignment in CS 101, there is no single right answer. Any program that people come up with that actually produces what is desired. Let's say the coding assignment is write a program to generate the first 20 digits of pi. Many, many people in that class will actually write programs that work. They will not be the same program. What that means is if you look in actually the evolution in the state space of the Turing machine, you're going to find that Jacopo's program and Matteo's program, they were initially different, but as those two programs are running along, they're eventually going to end up in the exact same state. Maybe earlier, maybe later. When that happens, by looking at the laptop, you cannot tell, was this Jacopo's program or was this Matteo's? I've lost information. There's a thermodynamic cost with that. So recall that the Komogoro complexity of a string is unbounded, OK? Because it, the, that whole business, I told you that there's actually very, very few strings with small Komogoro complexity. The number with Komogoro complexity less than k is um, upper bounded by 2 to the k. By Levin's coding theorem, you can actually prove that the minimal heat flow to calculate the minimal um, work required to calculate any particular output string for any particular universal Turing machine is, in fact, bounded. And that comes from Levin's coding theorem. You can't compute that bound, of course. Might be a very big bound, but it actually is bounded. So um, I think I will end it there for this morning, so for the first half of things. And let's everybody take, I don't know, a five to 10 minute break. Uh, if, if you have questions, you have to wait for the other minute. At 11. Yeah. 11. So, David, I have a Sorry. question. Mm -hmm. So, the last part was a little bit quick. Sorry? Uh, the last part was a little bit quick. Yep. So, uh, so are you saying that the heat flow is uncomputable? I'm, saying the, upper the, I'm uh, saying the upper bound on it is uncomputable. The upper bound is uncomputable? Yep. But so essentially, you know that this omega is less than 1, so don't you have an upper bound also on log z? Sorry? Oh, um, the, uh, sorry, the precise bound. So you can only come up with a loose bound. Oh, OK. With the precise bound. So we know that the, um, actually, I have plots back here. These are actually plots that people generated. This graph right here, this is actually strings um, uh, represented as integers on the x-axis. This is Komogoro complexity. Uh huh. It's unbounded. It actually gets close to log x. So the, what the result shows is that instead, if we're looking at thermodynamic complexity, it actually never gets past. There's some bound that it never gets past. Um, and that computing that bound, that precise bound, that actual limit, cannot be computed. You can come up with some value that's greater than it, but you cannot actually compute that strict upper bound by Levin's coding theorem. I see. OK. OK? Thermodynamics, in this sense, is different from computer science. So, so there is a comment or a question. Heat generated due to two different programs will be different. Yep. So one uh, will know which is which. Um, this is w which is which. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, uh, it, whichever one did. I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I can figure it out by just running so those two uh, programs so and seeing the heat Probably because produced. you were saying before that, uh, say, after we do the computation, 
then you cannot distinguish from the output uh, whether it's my program or Jacopo's program. Ah, but you can, pro okay. but you, oh, I but see, I see. You might be able to, dis these are bound, okay, so this is very um, carefully phrased. This right here is the minimal heat flow for an idealized semi-static process. So what this is saying is that um, uh, your program and Jacopo's program only one of them is going to be the one that actually generates the minimal heat flow. And that's what this result concerns. Can we actually distinguish the two programs um, by the amount of heat flow that they are generating? Yes, um, but the, um, uh, the business about how you get, have to pay with work here, this is basically an intuitive way of illustrating that at the point that your two programs converge, in even the idealized thermodynamic reversible versions of those two programs, when you lose that information, both of them are going to actually require some work. You're going to have to compress your gas, so to speak, if you've got a gas-based Turing machine. Um, there's actually a nice um, short science fiction story by Ted Chiang about how you can actually do artificial intelligence as using just pneumatic tubes and pistons and so on. But in any case, at that particular point, that you cannot distinguish between um, uh, your program and uh, Jacopo's anymore by looking at the state of the Turing machine, its head and its tape. Once you do that, that means that both of the programs at that point have to have actually applied some work. Mm -hmm. So what the, the amount of work that they generated earlier, they were distinguishable earlier. So it, could be different, could be the same. Okay, so other questions? So you're not going to sleep uh, <laughs> next week? <laughs> okay, so Gibbs, you have to come here. Sorry. Uh, I don't know, you say on, okay. you said like in one of your previous slides that the complexity of computing pi is less than Trinity just a, a list of string, a list of digit. Uh, I wish to know if when you say complexity, if for example I have maybe a Monte Carlo method to compute pi, are you taking a, an account the time taken by the computer? Um, okay, so I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but here's a really cool result that people in computer science, I don't know why, they haven't actually explored this. Komogorov complexity which I think this is part of what you're getting at, it is only concerned with the length of the shortest program. That program might take from now until the year 2100 to complete. Another program, which is only one bit longer, might actually, compute, might actually complete by this afternoon. Komogoro complexity says the first one is in some sense preferred to the second one. Okay. There is a variant of Komogoro complexity called Levin complexity, the exact same Levin. And what it is, the, um, let's see if I can get this right on the fly. Chances are not, but let me try. The Levin complexity of a string is defined as the minimum over all inputs such that the Turing machine for that input computes the string of the length of p plus the logarithm of the running time. So the logarithm of the time it takes um, u to halt on that particular p. So it's a natural way of addressing what you just said. And guess what? Levin complexity is computable. In fact, it's very easy to compute. Can people see why? It's got to do with the same thing as halting probability. To compute the Levin complexity, you just start writing down all programs and running them. And one of them is going to eventually produce your string, the one that just says, print my string. And we know that if we keep going beyond that, since we've gone to all programs up to that size, if we keep going longer, we're just going to be getting programs that just keep increasing this. So we can always compute the Levin complexity of any string. That 
I suspect, or it would be interesting to investigate whether that can have all kinds of implications in computer science, because it's not really been explored much that I can tell. But also, the thermodynamics of Levin complexity might be much more interesting than the thermodynamics of uh, Komogorov complexity. Dually um, Russian mathematician, so to speak. OK? OK. So okay. very good. So we take a break of um, five minutes, and then uh, we start again.